We're on page 100, lesson 10. And, but first, did anybody take time to actually watch a sunrise or a sunset this week? I watched a sunset. You did, all right. Good for you. Ken and Doris? Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I've seen them often. Really? <laughs> Good for you. All right. Let's look at the objectives on. You're in bed before the sunset. <laughs> It's been a while since you've seen a sunset, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not that bad. <laughs> Look at the objectives on page 100. <clears throat> um, so the, the three objectives for this lesson are, first, that we'll embrace biblical teaching of God's sovereign pleasure and unconditional election. Second, that we'll praise God for setting his electing love on undeserving sinners like us. And third, that we'll begin to see how the doctrine of election doesn't stifle, it actually energizes our evangelism and our prayers. And since we only have an hour for this subject, we're just going to kind of scratch the surface. But I hope this whets your appetite to study more and dig in more if it's something you haven't uh, already chewed on. Okay, question one there, right on page 101. They kind of have an interesting scenario of if you had a twin brother and you were raised in a Christian home with all the same advantages and disadvantages, and, and you become a Christian and your brother doesn't, and you both stand before God one day and he says, you know, why did you believe and why your brother didn't? What would you say? How would you answer that question? I was chosen. Okay. Any other thoughts? <laughs> Oh, well, you're looking for the other, uh, okay. <laughs> I was better than my brother. <laughs> right. I was just such a nice guy, you had to choose me, right? Yeah. Um, so, would somebody define, in your own words, the doctrine of election? What does that mean? Yeah. Before, every, before God created anything, what it was anything God chose us, he just had planned me. He knew when we were going to be born, mm -hmm. and he chose each of us to be his own. So, does God choose everybody? Yeah. No. No. So, how does he decide who he picks and who he doesn't? He just picks people. <laughs> we the council of his will, huh? Yeah. yeah. All right. There's, there's a word that has caused a lot of division between Christians. Unfortunately so, yeah. that's true. But for those of us who believe in the doctrine of election, um, the, the, uh, the burden for humility falls on us because, because our theological system, um, our understanding is that it's God that opened our eyes to come to him and tell, uh, for salvation as well as God that opened our eyes even to the doctrine of election. So we're bound to be, uh, we have to be humble about it. Whereas if the other side, if they think, you know, I've, I got saved because I was smart enough or whatever. <laughs> if I had enough faith, they could kind of get, get by with saying, you know, I believe in, well, I don't believe in election because I'm so smart, I guess. And, but we, we have to be humble. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense or not. Um, let's look over question number nine in this chapter, which is on page 108. Question 9 on page 108. First, if somebody would read 1 Corinthians 1, 22 through 24. It's printed right there in the book. Oh, wait, let's read it from your Bible. Are we... That's it. 21 to 24? 22 to 24. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. But we search, when but we preach Christ crucified, to Jews a stumbling block, and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. You know, you know. And I must say, I never saw that word until I fell into Jim's office too many times. 
<laughs> so question I was called to his office. <laughs> that was yeah, that's true. <laughs> question nine. Um, according to this passage that Dan just read there, what makes the difference between those who reject Christ and those who embrace him? Some are called, some are not. Percent. Okay. Yeah. How does that? How does this passage give us confidence in our evangelism? In our evangel, well, um, you're saved by the hearing of the gospel. So God does use us to bring about people to salvation. Mm -hmm. uh, we are the messengers of the gospel, and then He uses that to work on us. So, I mean, those who are elect, God is going to bring the hearing of the gospel to them, and by His grace, He uses us. Good. So, what does it say in this passage that we don't have to have in order for people to come to embrace Jesus? In our in our evangelism, there's you know he talks about the unsaved people are seeking what they think is important, but he says he gives them something different than what they're looking for. They don't need wisdom or science. Right, we don't have to have Jews seek for signs, Greeks search for wisdom, and, and um, Jesus isn't just a souped-up version of those things to give them what they're looking for. He's something totally different. But well, like Paul, you know, I don't, I don't bring a great argument. Mm -hmm. I just preach Christ and crucified. And why does that liberate us and <coughs> give us confidence in evangelism? We don't have to know all the answers. Amen. Amen. What else? We don't have to agree. Great speakers, or terribly smart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't have to be a perfect presentation. Yeah, right. God has people who are going to be saved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what? It really simplifies things, doesn't it? You just give them the gospel and leave it with God. Encouraging. Um, flip back to question number eight. Previous page there, page 107. And somebody else, if they would read the passage before that in the book there, Ephesians 2, 1 through 9. And you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works that no one may boast. So what does this passage tell us about the condition of human beings, including us, before our salvation? We weren't lovable. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, the sin of Jacob was as great as the sin of Esau. Mm -hmm. Well said. Which Jesus, I mean, God chose mm -hmm. Jacob. Mm -hmm. He desires to be his own. He desires to be his own. In this passage, he said not lovable. What else do we see in this passage? Dead in that trespasses. Dead, right. Dead. What else? <coughs> Children of wrath. Yeah. Who were we following? Satan. Mm -hmm. And so then, looking at this passage, what does this show us about God's grace? What do we learn about God's grace just from this passage here? He mentions grace three times. Mm -hmm. It is mercy driven. What do you mean by that? It is a byproduct of God's mercy. Okay, and what do you mean? <clears throat> How do they relate? Well, without God being merciful on his creation, there would be no grace. There would be no reason for grace. There would just be judgment. Mm -hmm. 
It's like really deserved. Yeah. How would you describe, uh, Mark, the difference between mercy and grace? Mm-hmm. Well, m- mercy is an emotion. Okay. Right? I mean, in- is that, or an attribute okay. that God has. And grace is a byproduct of that attribute or feeling that God has. It is a tangible outworking of that mercy. Okay. Anybody else have thoughts on distinguishing mercy and grace? Mercy is spectators, right? Um, not getting what we deserve, and grace is getting what we don't deserve. The uh, let's see. there's a quote on page one hundred and nine that is so fantastic. I'm going to read it, and then we'll go ahead and watch our DVD segment. Um, this is a quote on page one hundred and nine. Um, it's about how belief in the doctrine of election impacts our prayer life, especially as we pray for the conversion of unsaved friends or family members. And this is, I believe, a quote from John Piper's sermon on the subject, The Pleasure of God, see, The Sovereignty of God in Prayer. Um, what I'm saying is that it's not the doctrine of God's sovereignty which supports prayer for the conversion of sinners. On the contrary, it's the unbiblical notion of self-determination, which would consistently put an end to all prayers for the lost. Prayer is a request that God do something only the person who rejects human self-determination consist- can consistently pray for God to save the lost. In short, I do not ask God to sit back and wait for my neighbor to decide to change. I do not suggest to God that he keep his distance lest his beauty become irresistible and violate my neighbor's power of self-determination. No, I pray that he ravish my unbelieving neighbor with his beauty, that he unshackle the enslaved will, that he make the dead alive, and that he suffer no resistance to stop him, lest my neighbor perish. Amen. So now we will watch um, the DVD segment. This is a little bit longer. It's about half an hour. 